Very welcome back to Nordic SNC conference. And I hope you enjoyed the poster sessions. Uh, now uh, we have a panel discussion about uh, uh, testing and evaluation. And the goal is to, to discuss and share and appraise the topic of evaluation in SMC research and development. And this is, of course, an important part of uh, all projects. And, and some research projects uh, uh, have a very clear angle about uh, the need for development and uh, evaluation, whereas others uh, have uh, a more of a struggle to find different methods and uh, ways to do that. Um, so we will start this uh, session with presentations from uh, the different partners. So we're, we're starting with the uh, uh, University of Oslo, then followed by University of Iceland, KT8, and the Olbo University. Um, so I think uh, the, these presentations will be, are they pre-recorded or? No. <laughs> so then I would invite Oslo to uh, start. And then after this, we'll have a discussion among the panelists uh, uh, in the panel here and uh, also including and addressing comments that come uh, from the audience. And we'll conclude in just one hour. Great, thanks, Sophia. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, and um, I guess uh, my angle on this will be um, on what you could call, or the politically is called responsible research and innovation, uh, what, which could be summarized as kind of open research. And I guess that, that will be uh, the angle I'm, I'm taking on this, which is to me, I think the kind of the critical part of being able to do proper evaluation in the first place. So let me try to explain this a little bit more. So uh, you can think about like the open research landscape as a collection of different bricks in a puzzle um, where you can on the left side here, you kind of start on the application side when you apply for funding for, for getting some, some research project. And then you have kind of in the middle, you have all the different components of doing the research and then you have the outputs more towards the right. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these and how we are thinking at least here at the University of Oslo about these things. Well, first of all, when it comes to open access, this is something that everybody is talking about these days. Um, and we do have quite a lot of systems in place. We have kind of journals that allow for, for sharing things openly. Um, and also we have different types of institutional repositories. And this is very important, I think, because we it's, it's necessary that everyone can read the research we do so that they can also evaluate the content of this. But of course, the publications is only one thing. Uh, you could also say that even before you get to the uh, publications, you can start with the open manuscripts, which is an interesting thing that we have also been exploring in the NIME community now with this PubPub -pub, uh, platform that we have uh, that we used this year in, in, uh, in, at the NIME conference and also exploring how to kind of move forwards. Now, when it comes to uh, other parts of the process here, um, when it comes to the research methods, um, they in our community are very close, also kind of closely connected to the uh, source code of the different things we develop. And the opening these is important as for example, we, we kind of presented yesterday in the Musical Justice Toolbox, it's just one example of the different software packages that we have tried to make open. So in general, I think most of the stuff we develop at in Oslo at least is, uh, is open from, from the start. And then it comes to data, which is also a challenging part, but uh, we're trying to work on it. For example, we have released this Oslo standstill database with different um, data from uh, the championships of standstill. Um, a tricky thing is, is how to do this in terms of both how to kind of format the data and where to put them. Um, we have chosen to uh, make this available in, in kind of our Norwegian uh, database that we are, uh, that we're using, um, but also in Fusionet, which is kind of a motion capture specific database. In any case, the, it's important that we follow the FAIR principles so that we make the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is actually much more difficult than you imagine when you start doing this in practice. Um, and one of the things that we have been really trying to, to do to push and see how we can make this work in real life uh, research um, is through uh, this concept we have called Music Lab. And several of us were in Copenhagen two weeks ago where we did a big science concert with the Danish String Quartet. 
And then we, we also try to then open the entire kind of research process by inviting the audience in to see and take part in the experiment. We collected data on the musicians themselves. We collected data on and with the audience as well. And we also spoke about this afterwards. So we kind of really exposed the entire process to the audience. Now, there we are also now exploring the use of the Open Science Framework platform for sharing all of what we did there um, openly with the world so that it's possible not only for us to, to use and evaluate this data, but that also that the data and methods and et cetera, code, et cetera, can be used by others. But this is going to be successful or not, we're, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Um, a challenge, though, I had to mention at, at the end here now is the is GDPR and privacy issues that we need to handle when it comes to these things. Also, copyright issues, which is a major concern if you're going to be able to share these things so that we can use it in different ways. Of course, we would like to do this CC and use CC licenses, but we are kind of bound by a number of different types of copyright holders, which makes this kind of really challenging and difficult. And finally, for us, it's also very important to have open educational resources and can kind of say that we are going to launch a new MOOC on the Future Learn platform called Motion Capture in January. So if you're interested in this, that will come there again to try to kind of expose the methods that we're using. So our take to summarize uh, on uh, how to do evaluation in the SMC community is to really start by opening the entire process. Uh, it's only then that we can actually do proper evaluation uh, on our, our side, but also together. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, and then uh, we'll go on to uh, the viewpoints from uh, University of Iceland. So, uh, do you have something to sh present and share? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nashmin. I am a PhD student at Iceland University. And sorry, I could not uh, prepare any slide PowerPoint, but I'm going to uh, present verbally if possible. Um, I am. Uh, I have started my doctoral since two months ago, and so I'm the very the newest member in this, in this uh, team. I'm very happy to be invited to the, this panel discussion, and I hope we can share good information here. Um, we are working on the acoustic sound and vision uh, laboratory of Iceland University. So, based on my knowledge in this period of time as a PhD student, if I tell you briefly, I can. I uh, mentioned that our team project is working on designing haptic wearable devices to improve a perceptual music experience for impaired hearing and normal hearing people uh, to enhance music uh, perception and enjoyment. Our work is mostly experimental and in our subject matter, the evaluation of the measurements and data is very important because uh, based on this data, we take our next step and go forward. And uh, the first issue is to ensure that the measuring uh, instrument can provide us with the data with appropriate accuracy. For uh, this purpose, we need to first ensure the correct um, calibration of the device. And in the next step, having the appropriate instruction according to standard required to have a suitable procedure. And um, we can have a comparison between our results and such kind of experiment that has been done related to our subjects before. And um, empirical evaluation refers to the appraisal of the theory by uh, observation experiments. Uh, the key in good empirical evaluation is the um, proper design and execution of the experiment so that um, the particular factors to be tested can be easily separated from other confounding factors. And experimental research of, uh, often considered to be the gold standard uh, in research design is one of the most uh, rigorous of all research design. And as you know, the main method in our work is experiment and analysis of data and haptic wearable devices vary in collaboration to people. I mean, somebody who participates in our experimental test for haptic wearable device. And the benchmark is uh, participants um, perceptual that they can exactly receive uh, the issues that we consider as an output. And this allows us to upgrade and modify the device based on this uh, participant uh, practical test result. And we do not any interval uh, evaluation. We need to evaluate laboratory data and uh, results at the University of Iceland. But for example, we have a funder agent called RANIS to support students funding, which has uh, extensive grant support in Iceland. This institute has been monitoring all the student feedback 
monitoring the process and progress of projects that are under its own. I hope I could clearly explain how we perform to evaluate this data and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andersen. Um, so um, we'll proceed for, uh, with uh, some a few words from KTH. I guess uh, is that Roberto will take over and then we'll come with uh, some more questions uh, to all of you in the, the panel. You're muted, You're Roberto. Muted, Roberto. Like Seems like your hub is muted, uh, Roberto. If you're able to unmute it or on the machine or no. Now it should be okay. Or yeah, yeah, it's working. Yeah, it was not me muting then. There was someone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, so I, I'm presenting just a, a, a plethora here of methods that we are using here at KTH in, and I collected, I ask uh, colleagues here to, to contribute and you see the name of those who contributed to this list of methods. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, uh, projects, areas, research areas we have here at KTH uh, at the moment that uh, you can see to the left, uh, um, highlighted keywords in what we are working from effective computing, expression, movement analysis, nonverbal communication, media production, rehabilitation, ethnomusicology, MIR, and so on. If you are more interested, you can find all this project description online. But what is interesting for this presentation is that uh, what are we doing with kind of measurements uh, or, and uh, methods we are using? So here I took some pictures for some projects. So we measure uh, how we interact with sensors, how we interact with uh, electroacoustic device, uh, how their, their, their mechanical properties, acoustical properties, and how they, are, uh, they respond to interaction with them. We work with voice sketching and we work with representation of non pitch sounds and uh, we work also a lot of body motions different ways for instance uh, uh, analyzing motion that is uh, um, motivate or uh, as a, an effect of uh, sound produced by our body for instance and here it comes uh, this what you are waiting for a long time this is a list of methods that we have and uh, I don't expect that you read all of them, but to give you an idea, the, I try to make a sort of summary. In red are those who we always have been working with since the 70s, more or less, and the blue one are like the new entries in recent uh, modern time, okay? Uh, and, uh, and here, is a, a sort of super condensed summary of the keywords of this word cloud. So you see there is a lot of focus on design, uh, experimental methods uh, with uh, based on perception. We do a, lo a lot of user works, workshops and we actually are moving from the labs to the wild, as you say. So ethnographical studies, uh, uh, testing things in real situations and not only in the lab. Uh, so like non-controlled situations uh, and this cloud becomes like this when I put all together. So you see again, perception, design, um, methods of different kind, questionnaires uh, and so on. This is what uh, we are doing. So we do everything <laughs> as methods, depends on what the problem is basically. Okay, so we do both qualitative, quantitative, control in the wild, 
design loops uh, and uh, testing with both experts and laymen, basically. This was that. That was that, that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, internal KTH joke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, we proceed. Uh, I think Rasmus will be the one to present from Oldborough University. Oh. Are you ready? It was very difficult to unmute the hub. Oh, there we go. Hello. I had to press a button on the control surface. Can you hear me now? All yes. right. Yes, Great. we can hear you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to present the, um, from the perspective of, perspective of the multisensory experience lab, because at AU here we have a few labs that are dealing with sound and music computing research. One of them is headed by Sofia. One of them is headed by Stefania Serafin, and the other one is headed by uh, Chumhu Erkut. So I'm going to talk only from the perspective of the multisensory experience lab, and I'm sure um, maybe Sofia will introduce uh, her lab later. So to provide a bit of context, in, in our lab, um, the SMC-related research kind of falls in two categories. It's uh, applied physical modeling synthesis on one side, and on the other side we have um, extended the reality sonic interaction. Think of it as VR or AR sonic interaction. Um, and I think there is a there is a trend that we generally perform uh, perceptual studies, either to test hypothesis or to evaluate qualitatively novel interactions, especially in the in the XR domain, but also with the physical modeling uh, synthesis, we try to prototype new interactions. Um, but as well as general usability, playability, and other, you know, relevant, uh, musically relevant uh, attributes. Um, when it comes to the data gathering, we use uh, maybe not as many methods as uh, Kate H do. Maybe they have more people over there because the list was long. Um, but I think generally we use self-reports. We rely a lot on self-reports, being them online or pen and paper or uh, through standardized questionnaires like, uh, or standardized measurements like SUS, system usability scale and, and the likes. Uh, we frequently use observations as well and interviews. And of course there's the occasional odd methods or odd projects that require different types of methods. But I, I would say that these are the most popular one that we use in the lab. Um, and when it, when it comes to analysis, we are generally just stopping at, uh, uh, or just, but we're stopping at the analysis of mean using the relevant tests, being it an ANOVA or an F-test or man Whitney or whatever type of uh, assumptions that we have about the data. As far as I know, we rarely do uh, automatic evaluations, computer-based evaluations, and that's uh, probably because we have this participatory design approach to our research that kind of leans into the perceptual evaluation of our work. Um, yeah, and just to give an example, in one of my studies that I did with Sylvian a few years ago, uh, we used a convergent parallel triangulation method to use interviews, talk aloud protocols, and self-reports through a, a little bit modified SUS to evaluate the playability of uh, Tramba Marina. And um, that is a VR or Tramba Marina in VR, which, which was a replica, accurate replica of an old instrument using physical model, modeling and some uh, advanced haptic devices. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I can end by saying that uh, as our program in the SMC education, we have a music perception cognition and cognition course taught by Sofia. And uh, we teach experiment design to students in the SMC context. And they are encouraged to, or they actually have to run an experiment on their own. And um, we have good success of those. Many of these papers end up being as uh, accepted as different conferences as papers. So I think that was all from, uh, from my AAU. Multisensory Experience Lab. Thank you, Rasan. I see some of the students there sitting wondering about what their projects are going to be now uh, when the, the, the course is uh, transgressing into the mini-product part. 
So uh, uh, unfortunately, we're not uh, able to um, uh, uh, to include alto in this, but but I think we covered uh, a lot of the, the different areas. And in fact, uh, sound and music computing is a very broad umbrella for a lot of the things uh, that have come up here. I think, uh, Roberto, maybe you could share that slide again with all the different methods. We can start from there. Would that be possible? Yes, that, oh, just a sec. Uh, yeah. You want, so were, uh, you want the colorful one or the boring one? No, the one, one where, where you had marked the one in red the, that you always had been using and the blue ones with the new additions there. Uh, it's just a uh, good tickly answer. I just, uh, my, my personal opinion, but I think the red ones are for sure what has been always used. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I was thinking, like now, uh, from the other other parts um, parties here, maybe it would be nice to hear how you see yourself uh, if you agree with the uh, with this transition from maybe have always used into uh, into what is coming now, uh, or how you see the the users in in uh, the focus. Uh, the use of focus groups, including uh, uh, including them, also as uh, as Rasslan was also mentioning, and, and what is stated here with, in terms of participatory design. So we, would, we can just take one round here. Unfortunately, Nashmin had to to leave a bit early, so uh, we're a bit down to to three <laughs> three panelists. But uh, maybe we can start with uh, Alexander. But uh, where do you do you see yourself in in this picture? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, uh, this is a very good overview. Um, and I, I think we are also covering a lot of, of what's on here. Um, if you think more historically about how we have developed here, uh, you could say that we're coming out of more of a musicological music theory type of uh, department originally, uh, more based on score material uh, type of things. And then gradually moving into more sound and auditory based things and then also moving more towards um, uh, embodied perspectives, motion capture and also machine learning, etc. So we kind of had kind of uh, different trajectory, but we kind of ended up in a similar type of, of setting where we are right now. And I guess this overview here and also the presentations that we heard today shows that we have a very heterogeneous set of different methods, which is complex. Um, it complicates the way we work. It's challenging for students to get into, to understand where you fit into this. So that's also from, our, from us teaching this, it's, it's challenging to figure out how to do it. But, you know, but ultimately it's also super exciting because we're able to combine these things um, in, in the end. Good point. So we, we bounce the ball back to the students and, and uh, the last one sitting in the room there. How do you see this? Is uh, like, uh, are there any areas here that make complete sense to you? Or are there parts that uh, that are challenging and, uh, as Alexander says, a bit daunting to to face when you enter the field of sound and music computing? Well, please don't take me as the voice of the students in uh, the Nordic. No, but they so. can protest if you say something <laughs> dumb. To that, so. uh, well. I can only talk from my experience, right? And I'm currently in the first year of my PhD and I have recently just finished my, uh, which was yesterday actually, a course on uh, advanced qualitative evaluation method. So all these things are very fresh in my mind, but I can think maybe down towards the end of my master's project when I would say that evaluation method was still a bit of a nebula and I was... Uh, more or less trying to copy what other people in the lab were doing, maybe in a blinded fashion. And uh, maybe this underlines a bit what Alexander was doing that, uh, or was saying that it can be daunting for students. And uh, I don't know how, how Roberto is dealing if these methods are public for, for the students, because I'm imagining that I would have benefited from knowing what is the trend in the lab and what are the general expertise areas and uh, try to maybe talk to one of the higher researchers in the that that about the methods that I think it would apply to my to my uh, projects. And I know that Sophia, you have been my teacher, and I could have done this to you or with you. But uh, um, 
I, I think during the master's was a little bit of a nebula. It's much better as a PhD student. I think the understanding of things, it's, uh, it's better. Um, I can actually ask the students if any of them would like to answer this question. If they want, no pressure. So speak up or be forever silent. So the old boy, you know, no, I'm kidding. But uh, Rasan is, of course, uh, right in that there are a lot of things that uh, that are not easily penetrable or under, even like understanding what these methods mean if you're new in the field. So, so maybe while the students think about it a little bit, uh, Roberto, uh, how, what do you say? Are, are the, how accessible would you say that these methods are for, for the newcomers in the Kate age? They are very accessible from this slide. No, it's they are assess they are accessible. Uh, I, I understand the problem. In fact, um, we partly we partly address it. We have a compulsory course uh, at the uh, first year of our, our master program that is called uh, uh, Human Perception for Information Technology, and uh, the examination is to conduct uh, uh, an experiment that can be perceptual experiment or um, basically perceptual experiment can be of different kind like interaction with an instrument or, or uh, judging uh, you know emotions in music or associating colors to sounds uh, and so on and so forth so they they are exposed to some methods depending on the on the experiment and they work in group of uh, three or four students, and then at the end of the course, they have a conference session where they present the results in a poster session, like in a conference. So we introduce them this, and then uh, we have many. Most of the courses at master level are uh, in uh, project oriented. Especially, we have two courses in the, for instance, in the Sonic track, or it is called here, and uh, the. Uh, they have to work on projects. The examination is project, and they work one month more or less, or longer, actually longer, one half month on a project, and uh, they have to conduct a basically evaluating what they do. If it is a name or if it is a sound interaction with something, um, they always to evaluate it. And, and we teach, we use in this course, uh, as in a course it's called sound and interaction. We use the methods chapter that is in the sonic interaction design book i recommend to everybody there are 12 methods how you evaluate sound and interaction in the in the book edited by carmen Traninovic and stefania serafin which is so, a very good point um so the, just a maybe a comment from uh, from me as a moderator, if I if I may. I think uh, that typically we tend to use methods that we have used already, but of course it it depends about the from the research question. So you should always select your evaluation and the uh, and uh, experiment based on what the research question is, and that means that in some cases you venture out in some areas where you're not very confident. And there you rely on on uh, reading up from other other types of fields or uh, or venturing and, and discussing with your colleagues that you, if you're lucky you have some more hands-on experiences with. And for my own part, I think that that uh, some of these parts that are marked here in blue, uh, like for instance the the. Um, or, uh, or maybe not at least the red, the participatory design, the code design, research through the design, uh, a lot of these parts to, to more actively involve users into developing what the research question is. And now in the case what Alexander presented uh, to, uh, to engage with, uh, with the audience in at such an event, uh, that makes it open what the uh, what you're after and asking, but it's not necessary. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> <coughs> it's not necessary developing the research question. Uh, but uh, when when you're uh, you're uh, like in the case of uh, University of Iceland or some of the other work uh, here, you're you're trying to develop uh, some kind of tool or um, or method uh, 
together with a specific uh, user group, for instance, patients. But this also takes an awful lot of time sometimes, at least uh, how, how do we accommodate for that? Um, Roberto has a hand up. So. No, yes, no, I agree what you, you said. And, uh, but uh, of course, uh, each, each uh, research project uh, has probably its own uh, evaluation. It depends what we are investigating and so on. And I was thinking also what, uh, what Alexander said before, uh, this um, development uh, for more uh, musicological to more uh, technical, if you want, uh, or from the score to the human being <laughs> uh, development. But I, I, and I was observing here this list of words that I have, I was thinking that uh, there is an evolution in the methods we use, but depends also is connected, uh, real, highly correlated with the development of the technology available for working with uh, sound and music and interaction. So things that are completely unconceivable uh, 30 years ago, now they are like uh, super easy to do, and so technology implies a new, new development of methods. And probably in ten years, if we sit here again, I don't know to speak about this. Uh, probably we will have uh, fifty more methods because technology will be so developed. What it doesn't change, uh, but I always tell to my students is that uh, there is always a human being in the loop. And this is, uh, and this, what they have seen in our groups, uh, I think all the research group, uh, we have, all of us became a little bit kind of psychologists or perceptionists. So studying psychology and perception is a very important part of our uh, everyday activity and knowledge. So. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that uh, also. Yeah, if I, if I could present a model, I can try to do this old school if Stefano can help me zoom in on the whiteboard here. I can draw up a model that I typically like to use where um, you could say that one of the challenges here, um, it's, uh, yeah, there is Amy, is that we are working from nature here uh, and the natural sciences to some extent, right? And then we have the humanities. I'm not sure if my nice marker can be seen here. Can you see my marker? No, if you zoom in. I have another red. I should have had red and blue. No, it's equally red. If you zoom in, Stefano. This is the maximum. Okay, you cannot see it. Okay, well, I can I can try to explain it. So you could have like a, if you think about an axis from nature to culture, uh, from the natural sciences to the humanities, on one side where you have quite, we can try to think about placing some of these methods along that, that axis, right? Um, and then you can have another axis where you go on the other side where you kind of go from more science-based aspect to uh, the artistic ones. And what what is challenging with our field, you can't really see it. I should uh, should have done this uh, with a black pen pen instead. But in any case, um, one of the one of the challenging things is that we are covering so broadly, we're covering so many different fields and disciplines in here. And also at the University of Oslo, we're doing this. Uh, in the way that we are collaborating with many different people from the from musicology, from psychology, from computer science, uh, and also including the artistic methods. So uh, what is challenging, I think, from a particularly from a student perspective, but also from the perspective of, of senior faculty, is that we are balancing so many different types of methods and data types, etc. Um, what we at least here in Oslo are trying to do is that we are working very interdisciplinary, but we often try to break it up so that the students work more multidisciplinary, focusing on one particular thing or a couple of things, um, so that it looks chaotic when you, when you put it up like Roberto is doing now. But I think many of us are in each separate project, we are doing it more that we are using one or, or a few methods at a time. Um, and then one student project, for example, may only use one or two or three methods while you have 50 on the page if you look at everything. So I think what we need to be better at explaining and talking about is really what these different methods are, uh, have a very critical methodological reflection um, in uh, whenever we write something, uh, whether it's a master thesis, a PhD dissertation or an article, and that we also again critically evaluate what we are doing continuously. Um, that will help us move forward, I think, in, in the long run. 
Thank you. I, I would agree that, but it also puts some requirements on the on the seniors that we have to keep the overview and, and demand this critical view. Uh, Rasvan, you have the hands up, and I should remind uh, people in the audience and listening that please put your questions in the Q and A, so we can uh, have them up also. Uh, yeah, Sophia, you set me up perfectly because I have a question actually, and is. Uh, it's for Roberto and uh, Alexander, and um, I'm asking you as project initiators because uh, you probably have different overview than I have. So what is the emphasis that you as project initiators place on the evaluation methods, both in the incipient phase when you start writing or developing the project, but also how do you follow up throughout the project? What, uh, what's the, in, in English, how much do you care about evaluation throughout the project? I could well. I could start. Um, well, I think it it really depends. Um, I mean, if you talk about evaluation from a NIME perspective, for example, uh, I think it's important to always, for example, perform and evaluate how an, a new instrument that you build actually works. Uh, whether you should do that as a formal type of kind of more psychological type of experiment evaluation, or if you should do it as an evaluation of actually putting this on stage and performing with it. Can be different. It really depends on kind of the focus uh, and the interest of the people involved. So that's that's one kind of type of evaluation. But I've been through my work on open research practices. I've become more and more concerned about uh, not only evaluation for your own sake, which is important, of course, to do, do, do good research that that you do good research, but also evaluation as part of a system. Uh, or the research system that we are working within and developing. And that's why I believe it's so important to share data, to share code, et cetera, so that also other people can look at your code and, and reproduce what you did, ideally, which would be kind of a, uh, an evaluation for someone else, which could be part of a peer reviewing process or part of just looking at something and reproducing it later. And it can also ultimately help us in move research forward in the long run, because we are sharing our code and our data, et cetera, can build on what we're doing. So, so that's why I think it's important to bring in that perspective because we need to build, if you want to do more solid research, and then I mean solid in every <laughs> respect of the, of, of the word, uh, we need to think about the whole chain uh, about, uh, about this. Maybe uh, add to that before Roberto was asking. That I think nowadays it's also uh, almost ubiquitous that uh, you have to write a data management plan uh, when you apply which also should, should say something about how the data is treated and the survival, <laughs> future survival of the data. Uh, but this can also be a bit tricky if you, to, to anticipate what, what type of data will you actually get and, and how do you share that uh, with others, especially if you have many different partners and so on. So maybe Roberto, if you take, take answer Rasvan's question and perhaps you have something to add on that as well. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I agree with what uh, Alexander said. So if we, so evaluation must, should be, uh, I would say, uh, well, Clark, I would say, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, automatic, uh, natural, natural part of your research design. I mean, or the, or the experiment, of the research project. Okay. So many times when we do, when we design a. a an experiment we are going to to, to do it uh, a lot of um, a lot of long part of the process takes uh, writing down uh, exactly the methods and how we are going to evaluate it uh, to be sure that we are not missing something because uh, you cannot go back when the experiment is done so what do we want to evaluate and uh, how we usually do it uh, decided before of course you can during the course uh, or the design of a project experiment, you can have some loops, but you always have to keep this in mind. Uh, and then, especially if you are moving in a new, towards new areas and new, navigating new new water. Uh, and then there are cases where you don't need to do it at all, when you are super sure about what is the outcome. Uh, David Huron once said, ask your grandmother. <laughs> so if your grandmother can tell you what is the result, you don't need to make an experiment, basically, or to evaluate it. <laughs> but um, 
so this is what we do. I, actually, I learned this also partly by psychologist Patrick Yuslin in Uppsala when we were working on experiments with him. He basically wrote all the paper. The only thing that was not written were the statistical results, so the numbers. So the, the method and the experimental, the, the evaluation was already written how to, to do it from the beginning. Uh, but it, I think it's a good way of, of doing it. And uh, to, to complement also what Alexander said, when we did this, uh, we have a survey paper on 179 studies in uh, mapping from physical properties to acoustical properties in sonification. Of these 179 studies, only 50% evaluated the mappings. So, and uh, only seven, like, 7% of these were working like. So it's very important to transmit knowledge to, to the, your colleagues, our colleagues, uh, our students uh, to, to evaluate and to know is working, is not working, but for instance. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. The, no, that's also part of uh, Old Boy University uh, project work. Uh, it's a requirement actually that, that uh, one has to evaluate the, the projects as our students also know. I would like to just a comment on, on David Huron. He actually said uh, the grandmother research was that in, in most cases, your grandmother would know the answer, but in some cases, your grandmother would be wrong. So you still had to do the work. And yes, David Huron also writes this uh, paper uh, on forehand, which actually comes back to, to one saying uh, uh, that uh, Tage Danielsson used to say in Swedish, "Sell uh, är den som har som rette snöre att tänka noga efter före. And that doesn't translate so well into English, but it essentially says that we're much better off in thinking about what could go, uh, what would happen before. Uh, which is a, a, a very crucial thing to have in mind, as, as Roberto said, like when you're actually planning what to do, then plan all the way think all the way through, down to the to uh, what it means that you got the results that maybe you got and then you also start to think about what uh, what could have what could go wrong and what then uh, which is a I, I think a nice practice i would like to and we don't have to project the, the slide again but but uh, one of the the blue things there in roberto's slide um, that has come up is uh, is online studies so I would like to place it uh, to the panel. Uh, yeah, we have the online surveys, online questionnaires. Since we're all in, in the field of sound, this uh, poses some difficulty for the, especially for the experimental control. So I, I would like to hear the panelists' view on on how to tackle this, and, and is it uh, do we really have to have control in all cases, or and what are the options if we if we need to find out? Uh, how people are listening. I could try to say something about it and then can I say that what I had planned to say before you asked the question too. <laughs> um, I think I think it's important. Um, the nice thing about doing online stuff is that you can reach much broader uh, than you can otherwise do. So it's, it's a very kind of interesting approach to doing research. Um, and that's also important in terms of, of increasing the diversity of the participants in our studies, which may tend to be kind of uh, students in our own universities, uh, kind of being the main population of, of many experiments. So in that sense, it's, it's great. The challenge, of course, with doing things online is that uh, you don't you have much less control of what's going on. Um, and that also means that it's it's more difficult to design the studies. Um, but that also brings me to the point that I wanted to raise when it comes to planning uh, what you what you want to do, uh, both during the experiment and also afterwards. One thing is that uh, I guess there is a requirement to do data management plans these days. But also in psychological research, it's also a growing focus on doing pre-registration of the studies so that you actually uh, very precisely explain what you want to do and what you want to find out. And you register that before you do the study. And then uh, the idea is that you can even uh, have that uh, recognized in uh, different pre-registration journals, where it's possible to then be able to publish the results, whatever you find. 
And the reason for this is that you want to avoid kind of people uh, not publishing zero findings where you kind of are not able to confirm whatever. And that is also, uh, it's kind of important to also show the experiments that don't go well or that don't confirm with what you expected, et cetera. So I think this is particularly important when you go online and you kind of, you're delving into territory where you may not be entirely in control. It's even more important to, to critically reflect on what you want to get out of this before you start. A very good point, Alexander. The, the, I also was thinking earlier on, on this pre-registration practice that is now coming up and, and promoting the, the negative results, so, so to speak. Uh, Roberto, do you have any... Oh, sorry, Rasan has the hand up. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to try to answer the question uh, that you asked, and I think... Well, in, in the field of SMC specifically, I think there's quite a few things that we have to consider about when we do online surveys. And uh, we cannot avoid the bias of unknown headphones, for example, or unknown speakers. But I don't see that as a problem, as long as the problem is acknowledged at the test design stage, right? If we're gonna, for example, try to evaluate uh, sounds that have frequencies that exceed the common uh, common frequency range of headphones, then maybe that will inevitably produce a bias. But if we have to evaluate speech, maybe all headphones perform relatively well in terms of speech intelligibility or whatever. Um, what I'm trying to say is that as long as we account for the potential problems in the design phase, I think uh, online surveys are a great tool to, as uh, Alexander say, extend past our uh, general target group, the mythical student. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's about it. And maybe, I, I know that is, everybody says that it should be done, but I would like to emphasize the, the special importance of pilot testing when doing online research, because there's a very easy trap to fall into that you understand uh, just as well as your readers, and because the reader is disconnected from you, it's hard to verify that, and it's easy to just assume that, yeah, the reader must have been the same as me. But uh, especially in online uh, research, I think piloting is very important because we, you don't have any control over the attention and the cognitive load of the user on top of the hardware that they might use. And so, uh, yeah, piloting would be an extra good idea for online research. Yeah. Good point. Any uh, additions there from KTH? Yes, I can add. Uh, <clears throat> it depends, of course, what you online. If you are talking about online surveys implying sound, uh, it depends what the aim of the research is, of course. So, for instance, in the in the poster I was presenting in the poster session today, where uh, our students uh, they they tested the tweet sounds so or tweet messages tweets so it was done online of course we don't know what kind of loudspeakers they're using what kind of um, headphones they're using but this is the uh, everyday life situation so we it was not interesting for us to 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 know it the important the important was that they were designed that the sounds to to work on this kind of uh, everyday devices so it's a real uh, uh, real life situation we were interested in. We were not interested to, to, to have uh, so calibrated and kind of listening. So if we have to to do this, then uh, it's another problem, I think. Uh, one can, of course, deploy methods that uh, allow to have a remote calibration of blah, 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 the, the, the computer, remote computer and so on. But I don't know, I don't know if it's uh, it's interesting to do it. Probably it's, it's better to do if you want to investigate tiny, tiny, slightly uh, perceptual differences in sounds to do it in a control environment with some experts and instead of doing it with thousands of people, probably. But about this, uh, since I was looking who we have uh, in the attendees, uh, then uh, may I ask, uh, Sophia, may I ask, allow to ask questions to attendees as a panelist or not? Uh, sure, but I'm not sure. Then uh, we don't have time. 
no, no, we, we have some sometimes, but I'm not sure if they can answer with the, uh, I guess, uh, ah, or, or uh, Sylvain oh, has to allow okay. that, but yeah, sure, ask. They can answer, <laughs> I can confirm that I have the rights to allow to talk to people if they want, of course. Ah, okay, you are you. the god, uh, the god of the, the, the chat, uh, very nice. So or, or perhaps I, I, I can say just, uh, 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 just answering to the, to the audio control there. I think that in some cases it makes sense to, to check uh, if you, for instance, uh, for your experiment, it, 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 you would really like to know that they sit with headphones and not just the laptop speakers. And there have been like some tools around, but they, they tend to go in and out of, of style quickly so the, like the web audio evaluation tool um then uh, that has been employed for for some parts but, but so it would be nice with something that you could just off the shelf use when you actually need to make sure that people can hear with headphones and stereo and then, and not just click a box and rely on them and that was just a short comment there uh, yeah so fire your question roberto <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit uh, far away from what we are discussing, but it's about online uh, online evaluations. And I was thinking, if if he is listening, Ludwig, in the moment, uh, he was doing, of course, uh, online evaluation of uh, the sound quality of his uh, performances on this. And so, but it's a completely different uh, case of. Uh, uh, is evaluations of, uh, for instance, tweets, messages, or uh, expression in music performance. Uh, so I wonder if uh, Ludwig could uh, say anything about uh, this. How did you evaluate your performances and so on? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? How did I evaluate online? <laughs> What, 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 no, what you mean? How, how did you evaluate uh, your your performances with Gerard, for instance, your the the, the transmissions of uh, of sounds uh, between the, the different locations and your interaction with the different locations? Uh, because you are not testing this with users; you are you are evaluating with yourself and your uh, fellow composer. Well, I mean, I think there is um, there's all sorts of possibilities for rigor also in an aesthetic discourse. And while we may not have users, we have audiences. And we are engaging with uh, ourselves, our fellow composers, but also musicians and other people that we are working with. So I think it's an, it's an ongoing discussion that is perhaps not as hierarchical in the sense that we are giving someone a Likert scale and then treating all of their results in a sort of statistical similar way, but rather we are engaging personally uh, in a more sort of knowledge production, more in perhaps the way we would treat a symposium rather than a statistical understanding of a sort of a group of users, as it were. Could I comment there? Because sure. I think this is a very good uh, point and it's Going back to this, my idea of having like an axis between artistic research and scientific research and from an evaluation point of view, you could say that on the scientific side, the, the goal would be to try to find new knowledge and to try to find some kind of global phenomenon that you can extrapolate to something else. And then you need to have uh, a diff very different type of rigor and, and, and critical approach than if you are, for example, focusing more on the design thing or ultimately an artistic uh, goal where the evaluation actually may hinder your activity. So uh, it's, it, I mean, we, we need to be somewhat careful also about how much we focus on kind of evaluation and, and, and reflect on what type of evaluation we're looking for. Sometimes you may talk more about the evaluation from kind of reflection point of view, as you would perhaps do in more of an artistic research. Mm. While if you are looking for more, more in psychology, you're looking for more kind of rigor and reproducibility type of, of evaluation. Right, and if I can just add to that, I think that also there is a, a false security in doing something very rigorously, but the activity itself might be worthy of criticism. So. Like I, I talked about this morning, I think that these perhaps very rigorous, but at the same time, often quite small minded local lab experiments when you have your colleagues come in and say 
on a scale from one to 10, whether what they're trying out is expressive or not. I think that while there's rigor there, um, there's also, um, let's say, perhaps a narrowness in scope or a narrowness in, in, in how we allow ourselves to engage with the material that we are producing. I think that's also an axis to, to put into this um, multi-dimensional uh, analysis of how we evaluate things. Very good point. I, I think also uh, in any, any evaluation, one must also think about the validity. Uh, so the ecological validity is not necessarily always compatible with uh, rigorous experimental control. In fact, in, in a lot of musical experiences, it's not. Uh, so exactly, uh, yes. you, you point out a, a very important part here in all evaluation. It becomes, especially when, if we're after experiences that not always are easily accessible in terms of verbal descriptions or even uh, uh, conscious reflection without some additional thing. It becomes like uh, the quantum thing, right? Uh, we're, we're there to poke and therefore we change the experience. Mm. But uh, in, in many other cases, we cannot know without asking or measuring. Uh, so how, how do we approach this? And I think the answer to this may be uh, triangulation and, and mixed methods. But even there, one has to tread carefully. I don't know if uh, any of the other panelists would like to comment on this also. I, I agree, but uh, many times what, what we investigate is really a little laser pointed <laughs> case. It's very, very narrow and, uh, and uh, often uh, I found researchers that try to, to make this a general result, for instance, when you explain something that is uh, really, really limited to a little area and try to generalize. This is one uh, dangerous uh, assumption that often uh, we researchers, uh, especially engineers, uh, can do. It's very dangerous. And uh, this is something that we should uh, fight against, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is why I think it's very good to, to go more and more into this uh, into the wild, so what we learn, we acquire from HCI field to, to do experiments in real life situations. And also we need to enlarge, you know, this is an ongoing discussion, you know, all of us, so the scope, there is not only Schumann, there is uh, at least uh, some zillions of other composers who compose music <laughs> in different ways. So, so we cannot uh, base uh, our uh, uh, the truth of something just on one composer, for instance. Mm. Any other comments to this? I'm assuming you did not see my hand, so I'm going to just... Oh, sorry, the, I've start, I'm, I'm starting to have too many here. Sorry. Yep. No worries. No worries. Um, yeah, coming, and, uh, coming in this field uh, I feel like there is exactly what Ludwig said. Ludwig said a false sense of security be given the fact that we run statistical analysis and it's easy for the medical and the engineering inclined to feel that that is the case or there's the, there's the necessity for the statistical analysis of musical instruments or SMC related topics. But I would really like to emphasize the importance of the qualitative evaluation methods because I think it's it's really toning down this false sense of security due to the nature of evaluation. It, in the definition, it forbids you to generalize. So by maybe, maybe by not, not trying to generalize, the we as evaluators keep an open mind and yeah, try to explore the the minds of our users more instead of just trying to find uh, and quantify data. So. Um, I would think that it would be a good idea to emphasize uh, qualitative evaluation as Roberto is coming from the cognitive and uh, social sciences and translate their methods into SMC research. Of course, we cannot do that with machine learning and uh, spectral analysis, but this is not what we're talking about here.
I guess yeah. that's the, the challenge that there are so many different things you are doing <laughs> and so different, many different methods. So I think my, my thinking in general from a more inter interdisciplinary perspective is that I think everyone that has been doing more qualitative stuff should do a little bit quantitative. And I think everyone that has been doing quantitative stuff should do a little bit more qualitative. So if you, I mean, if you're all kind of trying to understand each other and meet a little bit more, I think that would be, then that ultimately leads to better research in the end. I think these uh, are very wise words that uh, also nicely puts the, the panel discussion to a conclusion. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we had, a, I think we had a nice discussion, even though there were not too many questions from the audience. I think we got around to all the important parts and uh, thank you again for attending. And I'll leave it to the closing session. Then.